Hello, hello. I am Karen Jean-François, and this is the Women in Data podcast, a podcast where every other week I interview some of the most inspiring women working in data. They discuss how data is used in various industries, share their knowledge and experience in the field, and equip you with tips to help you overcome challenges on your career and feel great. Let's get straight to it. I am joined today by Debbie Kerr and Yamini Krishnamuti, respectively data scientist and data analytics manager at MNG, to discuss a topic that is omnipresent in our career in data, glue work and getting the recognition for our work. Although you might be unfamiliar with the term glue work, it is very likely that some would have crept in your to-do list at some point or another. In this episode, Debbie and Yamini provide a detailed explanation of what it is and how it can divert you from the career path you aspire to. They then move on to talk about strategies to ensure that this does not happen and to help you to get the recognition you deserve. Hi Debbie, hi Yamini. Thank you so much for joining me on the Women in Data podcast. It's a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Karen. You're welcome. How exciting to have the both of you. So today we're going to talk about getting the recognition you deserve and also about glue work, which I didn't know about before I met you and I got super excited about it. This is something that we've all experienced at some point in our career and <laughs> and we still experience sometimes. So I'm looking forward to talk about that, see what the implications are and what people can do to avoid getting stuck into that. But before we get into today's topic, can I invite you to introduce yourself? Maybe we start with Debbie? Yes, absolutely. So hi, I'm Debbie and I am a data scientist at MNG. So for those that don't know, MNG is a fund management company um, and we handle the part of the business that provides MI around getting our products and services out to customers. So I work as part of Yamini's team. How about you, Yamini? I'm Yamini Krishnamurti. I'm working as a data and analytics manager within MNG PLC. I've been part of the fintech industry for the last 14 years. First few years, I worked as an IT engineer, and then I did my master's in data science, and then I moved to analytics field. Okay, so you did first work in IT, then you went back to university and did data science. Yes, yeah. Exciting. I find that very brave. Every time someone tells me, Oh, I went back to university. I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> very, very brilliant. Really, I got a lot of criticism. It was like after a year of my marriage, I went for higher studies. So it was not an easy decision. <laughs> oh, no. Well, you definitely did the right decision, I bet, because look at where you are now. And I'm, I'm sure you're excited about your role. Yeah, it's true. I, I'm glad like I took that decision. <laughs> yeah. Data analytics and data science is definitely the place to be. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed, exactly. So let's talk about getting the recognition you deserve. Debbie, when we spoke, we started talking about glue work the first time we, we met, but then you had a few examples of times where you were working and you felt like you didn't get the recognitions you deserve. So are there any examples that you could share with us before we get into the implications and how we can turn things around? Yeah, absolutely. For me, I think that we've got a pretty good recognition culture. But when I joined the working environment for the first time, I had quite a naive view on things where I kind of thought that if you worked hard and delivered quality pieces of work, it would just naturally lead to you getting recognition and you getting credit. And I think it does play in working hard and doing good work. But the formula was a bit more complicated than that. And I think that the first time I really started to see that was last year when I was working on two projects at the same time. There was one project that I was working on that was fairly high profile. It had a lot of interest from some senior people in the company and it naturally lent itself to doing a lot of presentations. Now, this project took up about 10% of my time and I got a ton of recognition for it to the point that I actually felt a little bit uncomfortable. 
But at the same time as I was working on this project, I was doing another project, which was using up 90% of my time. And this second project, I was giving my absolute heart and soul to it. I was having to upskill my technical knowledge, my business knowledge, my ability to coordinate a project. I felt like I was really pushing myself and going above and beyond for this project. But it didn't get the same kind of recognition as I got in the first project. And I think that that experience kind of started making me think, I wonder why there's that difference there. Because in my opinion, I've done a better job on the second project, but I don't get the same kind of recognition. And I think that part of it was it was maybe a less glamorous topic. It was maybe a bit less of the hot topic that everyone was interested in. It was a little bit more around maintaining business processes. So people just kind of assumed they were easy. Um, (laughs) And that kind of led on to the second part for me, which I think was around my communication of the project. I think that a lot of the time when you're dealing with people within data, they understand how much work goes into a data request. But when you speak to someone outside the data, they don't understand how much work they're asking you to do. Sometimes their perception of the work is very different. There's this idea that we have a magical pot of data and stats and MI just ready to throw out easily anytime. And I think that when people had that misconception, I didn't necessarily correct them. I didn't go to efforts to try and educate my stakeholders on how much effort I was putting into things. And because of that, I was never stopping to celebrate the work that I delivered. I was always pushing on to the next thing and getting a lot of requests through. It became an expectation on me that I would push myself because stakeholders didn't realise quite how much I was stretching myself. So it was quite an interesting one because although I was working way harder on this project, I wasn't getting the same level of credit. And I suppose it comes back to working smarter, not harder is the key thing here and making sure you do celebrate what you do. I like how you started the story with the fact that you were working very hard on a project and then didn't get the recognition. And then the fact that you thought that the hardest you were working, the more recognition you would get and you didn't see that. What I found very interesting is that in the same company, you had an instance of having your work recognized and having your work not recognized, depending on what projects you were working on. And you very much highlighted this data literacy thing in there. So the less data literacy we have, the less likely people are going to be to understand how much work has been put in something. And I've, back in March, posted a blog on the Thriving Analyst. It's the thrivinganalyst.com talking about the invisible analyst. And it's all around increasing your visibility in the office. And I guess that's more around communications, how you communicate things, but also making sure that while you are lucky that you had a part of your work that was recognized, many don't have that at all. So how do you get out of this loop where your work is not recognized and that means that it gets in the way of you progressing in your work? If we talk about the implications of that, so you spoke about Debbie, how you were putting so much time into a piece of work and then that meant that work kept coming and then people didn't realize how much work you had to do and then they kept sending you requests. Do you feel like this was the biggest impact and how did that impact your work? Yeah, I think that that was part of it. Like, I think my capacity was quite stretched because I thought you need to work harder, you need to work harder, that kind of mentality. But I also think that I started to not give myself credit as well. It's great if you have all the confidence in the world to know that you're doing a good job, but sometimes you need someone else telling you that validation from someone else. Mm. And it can affect your self-esteem and it can affect how much of yourself you bring to work, I think. You're not bringing your best skills and your best skill set if you don't feel like you're thriving. Yeah, and in terms of organisations, it definitely also results in lower performance of a team and people leaving as well. What about you, Yamini? Do you have anything to add? Definitely. I mean, for me, getting recognised is very important. I think the primitive need for any human being, whether they are like male or female, is establishing the identity, being recognized for who we are and what we have accomplished. Personally, if I don't get that, I might go into unpleasant situations, like I might lose the confidence or I might start doubting about myself. So I have to really make sure I'm not only telling myself and I'm also telling others what I have accomplished and get the credit, even if it is a matter of show off. You know, like I will often tell myself and other women, be brave to show off. 
unfortunately it doesn't happen often because even if you take me i have always been brought up as a child to be very polite towards each other if you have that kind of environment right from your childhood at over a period of time i try to be over polite over being reserved towards my accomplishment often i don't express myself and at a point of time i uh, i don't get credit of my work and i might go into a uh, imposter syndrome mode i do not want that to definitely happen if i could add my experience once i remember one of my hsbc days like where an a colleague asked me how i landed the job as a data scientist i was trying to be polite and i said guess i got lucky but it was not the uh, case so i had to go through three rounds of drilling interviews and then i finally landed the job so in the future i definitely did not want to get into that experience so i have to certainly work out certain techniques to avoid those situations <laughs> And we will keep you accountable for that, Yamini. <laughs> Next time I hear you saying, I got lucky, I will tell you off. <laughs> <laughs> Please do so. And you touched, Yamini, on pushing women to show their accomplishments. So you use show off, which sometimes I feel a bit uncomfortable with that because I feel like you would be, oh, look at all these great things I've done. But it's not always that. It's very often just about sharing a piece of work or showing the value that you added to the business, which is something that people are really keen to see, actually. How would you say that this lack of recognition impacts women in the in the workplace so you spoke also about your upbringing around being nicer and all these things it will definitely impact because they might miss out a lot of opportunities in variety of instances like whether it is a matter of promotion or salary increment or getting the right appraisal review I remember, I mean, if I just refer to one of the points Debbie mentioned, uh, she continued to deliver the work while waiting for that to be recognized. I read something called Tiara syndrome. Even I have gone through that. Women often expect that if they continue to deliver, they will be getting recognized for their work. Uh, Tiara will be placed on their head. But ideally, it is not the case in my experience in the real world. I remember my conversation from my HSBC mentor, Ravi. He said, many times we don't get things because we don't ask for it. So please go and ask things <laughs> if you think, if you <laughs> feel you're worth it. So unless I don't ask for it, especially as a woman, I'm definitely going to miss out a lot of opportunities and things which I actually deserve, whether it is a salary again, a job or a promotion or a learning or a totally taking up a new department, everything that's a chance I might miss out. <laughs> yeah, uh, make sure that you express what you want is a definitely very, very good and important tip. So that's one. Do you have any other advice on how to get the recognition for your work? I mean, so far I talked about what to do to get the recognition, but I also read and I tried to implement something new from my end, like from what I read. It's around how I implement those techniques, you know, in case if I'm going for a discussion with my manager or like a team member to ask what I want. There are certain techniques which I believe like it could be helpful. The first one, since I'm a woman, of course, I'm expected to be very polite and being nice. <laughs> so I will be a lot smiling and I try to use a lot of we instead of I and try to be very communal so that I don't often come across as arrogant or like bombarding my demands. It works in some way like so that we can sneak. So it is not the right way. Like we should be confident in expressing ourselves. Still, it works for me in certain instances. And next one is as a woman, there is a lot of instances we have to justify our request, you know, 
for mill they can get the recognition or the promotions whatever they need just by doing their work for a woman we have to again go back and justify ourselves if it is a salary increment we have to tell that like what i'm asking is as per the industry standard so whatever the work i'm delivering i believe the salary is important it will match up so i have to justify my request in order to get that so those are the two simple things i read it could be useful and as it has definitely helped me in the past yeah what about you debbie yeah i would say for me as some of the things that yamini spoke to kind of speak to me as well around justifying your request because i think that a lot of the time for me i'm always looking forward and trying to see ways that i can improve what the next project's going to be rather than taking a step to look back and see what i've done and how that's delivered value like when i think back to my first my first ever annual review at the end of the year when i first joined the company I sat and slated myself where I just I listed all the things that I wasn't doing yet that I wanted to improve in the next year. I'd literally just started my career and I didn't spend any time in my review talking about how far I'd come. I just started talking about how far I had to go. And it was my manager that kind of said, that's that's not the done thing here. That's not how you handle an annual review. That's not how you get pay rises. And looking back, it's stupid, but it's, it's what I did. So I think that I've kind of learned now to take the step back and look at the stats of what you've provided. That's number one for me. And then the other thing is, I think that recognition doesn't just have to be the ownership on yourself to make sure that you get recognition. I think that what we should be trying to work towards is that having a good recognition culture. And if you recognise other people in your team, if you congratulate them publicly and call them out, eventually it does come back to you. Because if people see you're happy to celebrate them, when it comes time for you, it won't be feelings of jealousy. It's genuine happiness for you too. And it creates quite a good working culture. We've got things like a recognition portal that lets us do peer-to-peer recognition. So when you send recognition to a colleague, it then goes straight into their manager's inbox as well so they can see what a great job you've done. We also congratulate each other quite regularly on our team's channels. We take screenshots of things that each other have done. And I think that that's quite a, a nice place to get to where if you don't feel comfortable boasting about the great work you've done, which you definitely should feel, but it's quite nice to have it come from your colleagues as well and have each other's backs. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with this recognition culture and and making sure that everybody feels comfortable sharing achievements of others as well. But it really made me smile when you were talking about, you know, your first job ever where you went to your annual review and said, all these things that you had to improve. And I, I do feel like this is a, a mistake that many beginners do. So don't beat yourself up too much <laughs> for that. But if I could give you an advice, you did mention about the fact that you look a lot forward to look at what's the next project. Something I do with my team is every time we finish a project, we just sit a bit, uh, review what went well, what could be done better. And when you do this, what went right piece, you could write down the achievements. And then that means that you have an achievement log that when it's time for your annual review, you don't have to think, oh, what was it again that I did eight months ago? You have it written down already. So that's one I find quite useful. As mentioned earlier, when we first met, we spoke about glue work. This is a concept that was presented by Tanya, really, if I remember well. Yep. What's that about? (laughs) Clue work Tanya Riley describes it as the less glamorous and often less promotable work that needs to happen to make a team successful. So the idea of it is that a lot of the time it's work that isn't part of your job description. You might be a developer and it's not development work, but it's really integral to the success of a project. Things like scheduling meetings, things like updating documentation, updating roadmaps, onboarding new employees, mentoring employees, identifying where blockers potentially could come up and making sure that you address them. These are all things that are arguably some of the most important parts of of making a team successful. But if it's not in your job description, sometimes you can find that it's not really valued by management when you then come to do a promotion. So it's good work that does need to be done. But if you find yourself being the person in the team that it all falls on, which is quite a common thing, it will all tend to fall on one or two people 
then it's quite dangerous for you. And it's quite interesting because these kind of tasks do tend to fall more often onto the female members of a team, either because female members are more likely to volunteer for it or just because it tends to get assigned to them for some unconscious bias that still exists. Yeah, and I like the fact that you mentioned if it's not in your job description. And I feel like in analytics, as you said, this is so important, but this is on no one's job description, right? Because our job description is to analyze data, build models, do these kind of things. But then it still needs to get done. And it does feel like it it should follow, it would be associated with team management, but especially in smaller teams, what I've experienced is that everybody is busy. No one has time. And as you said, there is going to be someone who is more likely to pick it up. What do you think are the, the downfalls of that? I think that it's quite difficult because it can either curb your promotion because at the end of the year, if you're trying to show all the work that you've done, but your management don't value a lot of the things that your time's gone towards, it can stop you getting promoted or else even if it doesn't stop you getting promoted, it can push you into a career path that you don't necessarily want to follow, a less technical career route that's maybe more delivery focused, which is a great career path, but it might not be the one for you. There's actually a blog post on No Idea where they give a really nice example of someone who is maybe quite early on in their technical career. They worry a bit that they take too long doing technical tasks and they find that they're able to add a lot of value taking on these kind of tasks and how they end up having their whole kind of role, their whole day set up just doing glue work. And it takes you through how they actually think that they're really progressing in their career because they think that they're adding so much value. They think they're doing jobs similar to what a manager should be doing. But in reality, they're actually, they're not progressing because of it. Yeah, I guess if you want to progress towards leadership versus a more technical role, that would definitely be quite useful if you're able to communicate it clearly. Yeah, I think that the best way to identify if you've got clue work is to think about what your career path is, where it is that you want to go and figure out what you need to do to get there. And if your day's spent doing things that isn't helping you towards your goal, you have to communicate that to your manager. For us, we have these career pathways that kind of shows what it takes at each level to get promoted, what skills you have to develop. So if if we're taking on a lot of things that we would consider to be glue work, We tend to try and have quite an open dialogue with our management around whether or not this is something that should be incorporated into a career pathway. Is it adding value? Is it like aligned to our strategic goals? And if it is, then we should add it on and we should make sure it should help people in their career. And if it's not, then that kind of work should be more fairly distributed across the team. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing things in a really great way at (laughs) RNG. So you said you talking about integrating maybe glue work in the career pathway if you identify that as a oh this is not helping me it's pushing me away from my career goal how do you get away from glue work I think it's quite difficult because maybe part of it is volunteering less because I think that sometimes when there's tasks that need to be done and they ask for a volunteer there's maybe a, a moment silence and eventually you put up your hand and you say okay I'll do it so maybe part of it is volunteering less Uh, to be honest I I put quite a lot of emphasis on being able to speak to your management the leaders in your team and have an open dialogue I think that you need a fairly flat structure where you can kind of have that conversation of I think this is impacting my career and allow it to come from management allow them to be more aware of the situation and allow them to spread it out more evenly it takes the burden off of yourself a bit So I do appreciate that that's maybe relying on you having a good relationship with your manager and being able to have those kind of difficult conversations. I can appreciate that maybe some people aren't in that position. Yeah, and I you do put a lot of emphasis on this conversation with the managers and there is also responsibility on them to make sure that their team members progress in the career path that they want to go towards. Yamini, how do you deal with that for your team? How do you ensure that the glue work is distributed correctly? First and foremost, I have to make sure, like consciously, I do not fall into any of the gender stereotypes. Personally, like if Debbie is part of my team, 
I have to make sure like I'm not assigning any work to her just because she's a female. We do have a concept of team rotation within uh, the analytics, whereas like every team member is being circulated across every pieces of work. If there are around 10 set of work we do within analytics, each of the team members, they go on a rotation. So every time they work on a piece of work for that week, they get equal opportunities. So that is one thing we do. Overall, I have to make sure like, Whatever the learning opportunities or the growth opportunities we provide to the team, it has been equally distributed. I mean, I'm still not an expert in that area. Like every time when I log into the work, it has, I have to be very conscious around that. For example, Debbie, she's very helpful team member. As she said, she volunteers herself towards supporting others. A lot of work she does helps quicker deliveries of our projects. So I have to make sure like the contribution uh, made from Debbie is being recognized. I should make sure like I never take uh, for granted, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. So those are the things that has to run on back of my mind. And we do have weekly for management forums wherein we discuss these things. Whatever we plan in the execution at the end, the uh, set of deliveries from the team, it has to be happened from everyone equally. So that brings out some sort of visibility around what everyone has contributed. So that is one of the key aspects we try to approach. Yeah, that rotations move was introduced by Amini when you joined the team. And I would actually say it's made a massive difference because it stops you always getting caught in the same kind of tasks. It lets you kind of rotate between the higher profile work and the lower profile work. I love this. You know how at the beginning of the episode we were talking about recognising each other's achievement and you were just doing it live uh, so that (laughs) I can see that this wasn't a lie. You're actually doing it. I love it. To close this episode, is there some resource that you could share that you use that helps you in your career and personal development? For me, there is one particular book called Lean In. It is a very famous book written by Cheryl Schanderberg. She is the CFO of Facebook. So many of the points I have covered, she might have talked about that in her book. So I can I can definitely recommend that. There is a whole chapter she talks about how women should take credit for her work so it's been a definitely useful resource for me i i have to admit that this is the book that got me into london um (gasps) i think that book came out in 2011 or something like 2010 2011 very controversial book when it came out i must say but she has this place where she's talking about the fact that she had this opportunity to go work abroad and she didn't go because she was thinking, oh, I need to, if I leave, I'm not going to be able to get married and set up a family when I'm meant to. And that how she regretted that decision, although I'm I'm pretty sure she's (laughs) pretty well off where she is. But I, I was at that age, so 2011, I was in my early 20s and I was having this kind of same thinking, being like, yes, but if I leave, I'm I'm going to have to start again from scratch. I'm never going to find a boyfriend. And then I read that and I, I said, that's it. I'm leaving. Bye. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Debbie? Is there anything that helps you in your development? Yeah, I think it's quite interesting because when I first joined, again, the technical path, I thought it would be the really technical books that I'd be recommending to people. But surprisingly, it is the the more self-help type books that I actually relate to and I feel like makes a bigger difference, like developing the soft skills. I think that the topics we've spoken to today, there's a couple of really interesting blog posts. I quite like blog posts because I think that they're easy to digest and can get snippets from. So No Idea has a really good one on glue work and then Locally Optimistic as well. They kind of really break down different ways that you can you can handle dealing with these types of situations when, when you find yourself fund them so I find these ones quite useful. Amazing thank you so much for joining me on the podcast ladies it was a pleasure chatting with you. Fantastic thank you so much. Thanks Karen for giving us the opportunity. Thank you for listening to the Women in Data podcast we will be back in a couple of weeks with a new guest until then if you have two minutes it would be great if you could leave us a rating or a review as it helps not only to make the podcast more visible, but also to enhance the content. 
If you don't want to miss the next episode, follow us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We are also on LinkedIn. And if you wish to, you can even register to the community for free. All you have to do is head to womenindata.co.uk. Have a great day.